Hey, before we get started with today's episode, I want to let you know that if you're planning for retirement or aren't sure where to start, we have a helpful checklist for you. We put together a guide called Your Pre-Retirement Checklist and have made it available for free on our website. This detailed checklist covers things pertaining to cash flow, social security, Medicare, asset allocation, and living a purposeful retirement. The link to download the checklist is listed in the episode description, or you can go to wiserinvestor.com, scroll to the bottom, enter your email address, and then you'll have access to your pre-retirement checklist. Thanks for listening. Welcome to a Riser Retirement Podcast, where we believe the best financial advice should always be conflict-free. I'm your host, Casey Smith, guiding you to financial freedom, or my co-host, Brad Lyons and Matthews Barnett. Hey, guys. Hi, Casey. How's it going? This is kind of like podcast part two uh on healthcare and retirement and today we're going to dive into um how does medicare work in retirement um you know our internal source for all this is our very own matthew burnett (laughs) cfp specialist ch i forgot all your designations that you have uh many designations we had to shrink his business card he's so smart um i want uh to start off with First of all, Medicare, you gotta you gotta sign up. You have what three months prior, three months after you turn sixty five, or during yeah the seven month window. So don't don't screw that up, right? Because you're gonna pay higher premiums for it if you if you wait. Um, now, if you're still working, what do you do? If you're still working, there's a few caveats to that. Uh, if you work for a firm that has less than twenty employers, you need to actually still apply for Medicare. Because Medicare will be your primary insurance plan and your group coverage will be your secondary. Uh, That's where you hear people that were unaware of that and then go into the hospital for certain procedures. Uh, And those are the horror stories where they have a huge bill that is actually not covered by insurance because it should have been covered by Medicare and they don't have Medicare. Um, So that's a a really important thing to, to pay attention to is how many employees you have, uh, just so the fact of knowing if you need to uh, apply for Medicare or not. Uh, if you have more than 20 employees, <clears throat> then you have the option of deferring and just taking your primary uh, group coverage uh, up until you do retire. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you need to apply uh, within eight months of uh, no longer working at that employer. Now, do you have to notify them of that, that you're doing that, or you just wouldn't apply in that case? You would notify them, but it's not like you have to uh, apply and restrict or anything like that. Um, so it's just allowable event, just do a special, um, a special signing period. So, okay. um, something to keep an eye on there. So, so you do notify them. You can notify, you don't want necessarily have to, because you could just roll during a restricted period. Cause otherwise it'd be the end of the year when you're uh, enrolling in a Medicare or during, okay. um, when you turn 65. Um, so it's just important to figure out how many employees you have and then figure out the proper strategy, uh, to enroll. Um, a lot of times some people still want to have some additional coverage from Medicare, uh, you could always receive Medicare Part A, which we'll go over, yeah. um, but that's been paid into um, while you're during your working years and doesn't have a premium. Okay. So, so that would help supplement some hospital insurance costs. Sure. Um, you just have to be, decide whether you want to pay Medicare Part B because that does come with a premium. So you would be paying your group coverage plus a Medicare Part B pre- premium. That would be your secondary coverage. So a- every situation is different. All right. So let's talk about Part A then. Yeah, Part A is just your typical uh, hospital insurance. So it covers inpatient care, uh, skilled nursing, uh, and hospice care. So really, any type of services um, throughout a hospital. Uh, that's really anybody that's paid into Social Security um, for a certain amount of quarters would receive uh, Part A, and there's no premiums for that. So uh, nothing. Just, just got to be 65. Be 65 and paid in the quarters enough to to receive it. Uh, you get no premiums. Is a good way to uh, get some hospital assistance should you need it. Okay. Uh, then part B, this is what we're, this is the part that we used to, we, where we usually see uh, premiums being deducted for, or if you're not taking social security yet, you have to write them a check, right? Right. And you saw last year it increased pretty significantly. It did, yes. uh, while they increased the COLA on social security about 6%, the basic Medicare part B premiums, uh, which are based on income increased from 148 a month per person to almost uh, $170 and 10 cents. So pretty significant increase in a monthly payment. Okay. So on the part B, um, you know, we always hear about the donut hole. Is that the difference between the part B and the Medigap or the supplemental? Correct. That'd be more out of pocket. Um, 
But Medicare, what you hear a lot of too, is IRMA, Income Related Monthly Adjustment Amount. Yeah. Uh, and that's where uh, your income can affect pre- two years previous income, actually, because they've got to figure out what your income is and they look at your previous tax return. Uh, that's why we discuss making sure that you control your income in retirement. You don't have big IRA withdrawals or certain uh, transactions that are going to increase uh, your premiums. So I think it's $182,000 for a married couple is the first tier. Correct. 182000 91000 for individual. And that's uh, $170 a month now. Correct. Last year it was one forty eight. Um, 91,000 to 114 is an individual or 182 to 228 joint is 238. So you rarely see clients in that threshold, uh, but that is a little bit more. And then all the way up to 114 to 142 for an individual or 228 to 284 would be 340, uh, 20. But you can see how, if you had a huge lump sum withdrawal that it could increase your premiums, um, yeah. throughout the year. So let's say we do a lump sum of draw and we pay off a, a mortgage. Is it going to be a higher premium for two years or will it be a higher premium for just that one one year? It's just an annual. Um, you would just have to, you might have to file a restricted application, letting them know that it was one of the eight qualifying events. Um, so obviously during your working years, two years later, you're no longer working. Yeah. You're basing that income uh, on your working years. Right. So you just fill out the form and let them know that uh, you're, that's one of the qualifying events, whether it be marriage, a divorce, or uh, no longer working, the fact that you uh, your incomes uh, decrease significantly. Okay. Um, and, th- and that's something, too, is in, in retirement, you alluded to this earlier. Uh, if, you're doing, if you're doing withdrawals from an IRA uh, or anything that's taxable, you have to be careful that you're not, um, uh, you're not, you're not withdrawing too much to go into the next tier. And we often see that with like Roth conversions. So you go do a big Roth conversion from IRA to Roth. And if you do, if you do too much, you're going to end up paying uh, more in Medicare premiums, potentially. Potentially per Which person. The, the, so. next, the next tier is not horrible. You just want to be in that third tier. I feel like that's pretty bad. If you're paying that much. Yeah. And if you plan for it, then it's not sticker shock and that's okay. But um, not realizing that sometimes can be an issue for some people. Right. All right. Um, so let's go about Medicare Advantage plans. Uh, Medicare Advantage. So I, we actually didn't mention that Part B was for uh, more outpatient, and that'd be your doctor's coverages. So right. A A was hospital. B would be just for any type of medical expenses with doctors, and that's what that covers. Okay. Um, you mentioned uh, uh, Medicare. Uh, so so you you have a choice. You can sign up for Medicare Advantage, or you can sign up uh, for Medi- a Medigap policy, right? Correct. So you can do the A, B that we discussed, uh, and then do Part D, and then have which what, is drugs prescription drug. Part D is is drug coverage. Correct. Mm-hmm. Uh, usually, there's about a twenty percent coinsurance uh, gap there, and so to fill in that gap, you would take a Medigap policy or a Medicare supplement is what it's called, uh, and that would be how you get full coverage there. Uh, if you didn't want to go that route and you wanted to go the private insurance route, you could always just get a Medicare Advantage which is kind of known as a C, Medicare C plan. Uh, but a Medicare Advantage plan is just a one-size-fits-all. It's going to include your A, B, your D, uh, and then it'll even include vision and dental in some cases. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's uh, a little less costly. So uh, kind of the, the decision you have to figure out is you just want to go through the government plans, the A, the B, uh, the D, get the Medigap to fill that hole, or decide if you just wanted to go the Medicare Advantage route instead. So... How do you know which one to choose? What's that really based off of? Every situation is different. Like, um, like medications or is, medical issues you're already having or you think you might have? Uh, medications were a big one. That's even for Medicare Part D, if you're on Medicare, um, it's something you want to reevaluate each year because certain drug coverages will be on that and some years they won't. So you just got to make sure each year that you're updating your Medicare Part D. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you did decide to just go to the Advantage, Sometimes clients go there because uh, it's significantly cheaper. So it's all in one plan and it's less expensive. Um, the one caveat to that would be that uh, it's kind of like a HMO, more in-network plan. Okay. So if you had your doctors nearby that you worked with and really liked, um, that's a good option because it's less costly uh, and you're still getting great coverage. Uh, however, if you're somebody that uh, might have certain specialists in different areas that could be out of network, or if you're somebody that travels to different cities or uh, around the country, uh, then it might need to have a discussion on if Medicare Advantage works or if just going the other route would be a, a better option because not always about the upfront costs. There could be some other uh, issues that come about along the way. 
So it just depends on your situation. Uh, I believe, is it Medigap costs more than the Advantage? Isn't Advantage a little cheaper? Yeah, Advantage is the cheapest one um, because it's technically subsidized from your Part B through the government. So it's a private insurance plan. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, a lot of times you think it's free. It's really not, but it is less expensive. Uh, but you don't, uh, like I said, you don't get uh, added network coverages. So you just have to be careful with that. And then the the meta gap option. I mean, man, there's there's like hundreds of choices. Uh, alphabet soup, yeah, A B D all the way up, <laughs> right? Um, but then even when we go, to, uh, we we have a uh, a healthcare uh, broker that we go to uh, for you know on behalf of clients or clients we refer clients to them. Um, you know, even for my own grandparents, I remember saying, "Well, we put your grandmother in a free one." <laughs> Does I mean free one? Well, she got a free one because of her income being so low, she was able to qualify to be in a in a free, um, uh, I guess, through Georgia um, uh, uh, Medi- Medicaid, right? But then still, it was but it was a part of this option here. And then some clients come in and they are paying twenty bucks a month, thirty bucks a month, and then others are paying hundreds of dollars a month. So there's there seems to be different levels of coverage, even within the Medigap option. There are, there's a ton of them. Um, kind of, they say the, the, the one that's most popular that you see with uh, clients is um, a G, the G plan, Medigap G. Mm-hmm. Um, like you said, there's a, a lot of options. It can be very confusing. And the way that you would really figure out what's the best for your situation uh, would be analyzing some of your options. And then usually speaking with a, a Medicare specialist on based on your income, based on your health concerns, medications, uh, and costs, um, and, and a few different situations, uh, what would be the best option uh, for you? Can you uh, switch from a Medigap to an Advantage? Great question. Um, that was what I was about to ask is, um, <clears throat> if you go to Medicare Advantage, you have to be careful because there is a time period on when you're eligible um, for the Medigap policies. So if you went decided to go Medicare Advantage and you wanted to switch back over to ABD, uh, and then the Medigap, uh, you have to be careful that um, they don't actually have to give you that coverage. So if you have health concerns uh, after that period, you might actually be denied the Medigap coverage. Uh, and obviously, like we mentioned, that would leave a 20% coinsurance uh, gap. Yeah, that, that could be a big problem. So you have to be careful if you're going the Medicare Advantage route that um, if you decide to move, they don't have to guarantee you coverage. It could be health-based. And just, just be careful on that. Okay. Um. And then you renew once a year, right? It's just like working. You have open enrollment. So when you when you go to that open enrollment, I assume that you can. There's some changes you can make um, with, with which company you use or whatever. So you're not picking one plan and you're stuck to it forever, right? It's something you want to adjust annually. Uh, and like I mentioned, the the biggest one if you're on A, B, and uh, D is just looking at your D coverage because that's going to be based on um, your prescription drug coverage. Uh, and each year as things are covered on, just like your other insurance plans, some years are covered, some years are not. You got to make sure that the plan or the prescriptions you're on are actually covered each year. So definitely want to reevaluate your, your Medicare part D uh, every year on an annual basis. Um, if you happen to be 65, but you don't qualify for social security for some reason, you can still get uh, Medicare. You just got to pay the premiums. So it's, it's uh uh, Social Security and Medicare are two separate things. I, I have seen people <laughs> try to combine that into into one. Yeah, I've heard Social Security <laughs> starts at sixty five, or Medicare doesn't start till right. sixty seven because they get them confused. Right. Exactly. Um, okay, so anything else you think we missed on on this? I mean, that's a pretty uh, uh, pretty brief overview of, of of how it all works. Uh, it's all very complicated. Uh, here at our firm, we we refer that out to uh, some professionals who study this stuff every single day, right? So there's no doubt that it's confusing. It's confusing. They have specialists. So we do have software that can help you decide kind of what might be the best option. Uh, we can analyze within the financial plans, the cost differential between uh, ABD uh, and Medigap versus uh, Medicare Advantage. Uh, but like we said, you know, every situation is different, uh, different laws, and there's different things based on your income and your, your own health concerns. So definitely a, a big decision and something you want to, make sure that you get right initially uh, by speaking to a specialist. Uh, and then like we mentioned, just making sure throughout retirement that you understand with the two year look back period. And then with your annual income uh, that you're controlling that income each year so that you don't get uh, significant increases in your Medicare part D premiums 
Uh, it'll also increase your Medicare Part D as well, but it's uh, not as significant as what would happen with your Medicare Part D or B, excuse me. Yeah. And as far as quality of care, people think, oh, you know, when I go on government care, Medicare, it's going to be, you know, it's not as good as the private insurance. That's not the case at all. Um, covers covers pretty darn good. Um, I mean, obviously we've seen clients with hip hip uh, replacements, knee replacements, very little comes out of pocket uh, with, with these uh, policies. Yeah, it's more expensive if you had full group coverage where you never paid because right. now you are having to pay. Right. But if you had private insurance before, had to subsidize your group policy significantly, uh, Medicare might be cheaper, but you're still getting quality coverage. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Matthews, thank you. Enjoyed it. One other caveat I would say is uh, just remembering that uh, usually it stays at the borders. So uh, making sure that if you're doing international travel, understanding that it probably won't cover international uh, travel. So Okay, and there's insurance you can buy for that. Correct. So just something to consider that there's some policies that do, some that don't. Uh, just making sure you don't have a, an event that could occur while you're overseas that could uh, you know, possibly derail retirement or be a, a big unforeseen uh, thing that occurs. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Thanks for listening to a Wiser Retirement Podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Make sure to subscribe wherever you're listening. That way you don't miss any new episodes. We would also appreciate if you could leave a rating and review. If you have any questions about anything that was discussed today, head to wiserinvestor.com and reach out. We would love to hear from you. This episode was produced and edited by Lilton Moore.